This is the last section on the gas laws. Uh, so we've talked about Gaylor Sachs law, we've talked about Boyle's law. Um, what we need to do is to put all this together and do a little bit of theory with particle motion to try to work out what's going on with the individual particles so far. We've only really been concerned about the bulk properties of gases, that's what will a, a cubic metre of gas do. In this we need to also look at the individual particles, how can we explain these laws using the idea of individual particles of gas. Um, so we need to talk about first of all what an ideal gas is. All of this is um, theoretical, none of it is actually totally correct for all for any gas. Okay, but this is a theoretical analysis for an ideal gas. All gases are non-ideal, um, but some gases are much closer to being ideal than um, others. So an ideal gas is one where the particles take up no volume, and also there is no force between the particles. Okay, as I say, obviously no gas is ideal. But if the temperature is high, then the forces that there are become negligible because the kinetic energy of the particles is so much that the small forces between them don't have much effect on them. And also, if the pressure is low, then the volumes of the particles is very small compared with the container. So that also becomes a good approximation. The closest thing we've got to an ideal gas, okay, this is helium. Helium, because it's got very small particles, it's number two in the periodic table. Um, and it's a monatomic gas, so you might think hydrogen would be better, but remember there's two atoms of hydrogen in the hydrogen molecule. And there are no um, electrostatic dipoles within it. It's got a nice even distribution of charge, which means there are minimal forces in between the particles. So helium's the closest thing we've got to an ideal gas, but no gas is actually totally ideal. So here's the tricky bit. This is molecular kinetic theory where we try to explain all these rules in terms of what's going on to a particle of gas going around inside a box. So here's our particle. Remember we've said on the first two bits that the way this particle creates pressure is to move around the box. As it moves around the box it collides with the sides and this creates the pressure. So how can we analyse that mathematically? Well, let's look at our box. We'll give it a length x a depth y and a height z. Here's the particle. We're only going to look at it going in one direction for a start. So we're going to imagine this particle is just going forwards and backwards up and down this box. Okay, clearly this is um, not a typical particle, but if we just do this direction of motion first, then we can work out what's going on if it's not moving in this one direction. Okay, the pressure it causes um, comes from the force that you need to make it change direction. So as it hits this wall, there's a pressure created on that wall um, and that comes from the force to make it go from going to the right into going to the left and the force of the wall of the particle the, sorry the force of the particle on the wall is the same as the force of the wall on the particle this is Newton's third law okay if the particle exerts a force on the wall the wall must exert a force on the particle okay so if we can work out the force that must ha that must um, act on the particle that's the same as the force that must act on the wall just in the opposite direction and we also remember from Newton's second law that the force is the rate of change of momentum. So this is the change of momentum divided by the time. A crucial thing to understand here is when we're talking about the time, we're not talking about the time where it, when it's actually hitting the wall. Okay, We're talking about the total um, amount of force over the total amount of time in between the collisions. Obviously, if there was only one particle in the gas, the pressure on this wall would be changing. And it is changing, but there are so many particles in the real world that you don't notice those little individual um, forces created by individual particles hitting the wall. Okay, so when the particle hits the wall, what's its change of momentum? Well, it's going this way, and its momentum is mcx. Then it's coming the other way, so its momentum is m times uh, minus cx. So it's going from plus mcx to minus mcx. So the change in momentum is 2mcx. That's our first thing we need to remember as we click over the slide. So the time between the impacts is 2 times x divided by 6. This is just time equals distance. So the distance it's got to travel is there and back is 2x divided by its speed cx. This makes some assumptions though, and the key thing to pass in the exam here is that you don't need to understand or be able to um, write out this derivation, but you do need to understand the assumptions that we make, so the things that might make a gas not be ideal. So the first assumption here is the size of the particle is much, much less than the size of the box. So I've done a silly little animation here just to show that, that if the particle was nearly as big as the box, 
it's not actually moving this distance. Here's our distance x, but the particle's not moving that far. So we're assuming that the size of the particle is much less than the size of the box. We're also assuming the time for impact is much, much less than time between impacts because we're assuming a constant speed of cx. Well, if this particle hit the side and squashed up, so it slowed down and then bounced back like a big kind of spongy ball, okay, that wouldn't be true. It would be traveling at a slower speed than that during the collisions. So what we've got to assume is the time that it's actually hitting the wall for, where it's slowing down and speeding up again, um, is much, much less than the time in between those impacts. Okay, we're also assuming that there are no forces between the particles because it's got to be going at CX all the way across. If there's particles slowing it down on the way, it might take a different amount of time to get between the two ends of the box. So here's three of the assumptions that we have to make in der deriving the equation. Okay, but that if we can do those assumptions, that gives us this. Here's our force, 2MCX is the change of momentum. Here's the time, 2X over CX. Okay, the twos will cancel out, and we'll end up with mcx squared. By the time we've taken this cx to the top, mcx squared over x. So this is the force created by one particle hitting the box on one face of the box. So to get the pressure, we do force over area. Well, the area of that end um, is y times z. So what we've got now is mcx squared over x divided by yz. But you'll notice we've cleverly now got x, y, z all together, and x, y, z is the volume of the box. So that becomes P equals mcx squared divided by V. Okay, if we just multiply it by the V, we get PV equals mcx squared. Remember, cx is the speed or the velocity in the x direction. Okay, so, but we haven't got one particle in this box. We're going to have n particles in the box. So to work out the total pressure PV, we're going to do all the separate particles. So here's our particle number one, particle number two, particle number three. We've got to add all those together. Um, but what we can do is we can just take our n particles out the front and just do the average. So if we do the average of all the CX squares, we can multiply it by the number of particles and that'll tell us the pressure. So we get to this equation. And then assuming the motion is random, what we know is that cx squared plus cy squared plus cz squared is the total, the actual speed of the particle. So if it's not just traveling left and right, if it's traveling in some other kind of direction, okay, then cx squared is just a part of the c squared, its actual velocity. But those three things added together by Pythagoras are equal to the total velocity, the resultant velocity. But if the motion is random, so here's our fourth assumption, if the motion is random, these three things on average should all be equal. So the mean of the CX squareds and the mean of the CY squareds and the mean of the CZ squareds, they should all be the same. But if we add them together, they become to C squared. So each one of them is a third of the C squared bar, the mean average square velocity. Sorry, I'm going to say that again. The average of the squares of the velocities. So that gets us to the ideal gas equation, which is PV equals a third NMC squared bar. Okay, c squared bar is the mean of the speed squared. Okay, now you, if you're thinking that's going to be a bit tricky to remember, okay, let me just say again, you don't need to be able to do this derivation. All you need to be able to do is to say what the assumptions are that allow us to come to this equation. Okay, just a little bit more on this, the Boltzmann constant K. Okay, this is talking about rather than a whole gas, PV equals NRT, this is a single particle. So... Um, this is PV equals NKT. So if we're talking about a big N, the number of particles, okay, then we get this separate constant, okay, where this is the constant for one particle, the Boltzmann constant, where we're talking about a number of particles rather than number of moles. Okay, if you're trying to think, well, that's a bit annoying, I've got two Ns here, am I going to remember which is which? Remember, big N is going to be a huge number because we're talking about how many particles there are where a small n might be a small number, because we're talking about a number of moles. So we can get a value for this Boltzmann constant k, which is going to tell us about what individual particles are doing, because we can see from these equations that nk has replaced little n times r. But we know that n and n are related, because the number of particles is just Avogadro's number times the number of moles. Okay, so if we just do a bit of arrangement on that, 
The number of moles times other Gaudreau's number times the constant must be equal to the number of moles times the gas constant. You'll notice the number of moles cancels out, so I just end up with the Boltzmann constant is the gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. So you just put those in, and you get that the Boltzmann constant is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23. This is in joules per Kelvin. Obviously, no need here for the per mole, because we're not doing per mole, we're doing for one particle. Okay, The Boltzmann constant is joules per Kelvin. Okay, so here's just another string of equations, really, that we're going to get the different equations will be useful for different times. They're all in the data sheet, so don't worry too much. So we know that the average kinetic energy of a particle is a half m times the average of the squares of the speed. And we also have just derived that PV equals a third nmc squared bar. So if we put those two equations together, I can take the mc squared, but it's 2ek from this equation. I get PV equals two-thirds NEK, so the pressure times the volume is two-thirds of the number of particles times their average kinetic energy. We also know that PV equals NKT from the previous slide. Okay, put those two equations together, we're going to get the kinetic energy is 3 over 2 KT. This is an interesting equation, I think, because it shows you that the average kinetic energy of particles only depends on the temperature. Okay, so if you've got different gases at the same temperature, the kinetic energy of the particles is the same. This is why helium particles go much faster in a gas than argon particles, for example, because they're much lighter and they have the same energy, so they must be moving faster. Okay, if we put that together also with PV equals nRT, okay, then we get this string of equations here where we can just do a little bit of algebra on this, and we end up with this equation here, which is the average kinetic energy is also 3 over 2, times R times the thermodynamic temperature divided by Avogadro's number. Okay, all these equations are on the data sheet. All you've got to do is look at the sort of information you've got in the question to work out which is the most efficient way of using them. So last little thing, just to give us an example. So can you calculate the mean square speed, what's sometimes called CRMS? Remember RMS of voltages and currents from year 12? So CRMS, the mean square speed of the gas particles in the room at the moment. So just to make our life easy, let's assume that the air is just made of nitrogen. Okay, then it's 23 degrees C in the room. Okay, we end up with Ek is 3 over 2 kT. So this is kinetic energy. Remember, this K and this K aren't really related to each other. This is K for kinetic energy. This is K for the Boltzmann constant. So 3 over 2 kT is 3 over 2 times the Boltzmann constant times the absolute Kelvin temperature there, 300 Kelvin. Uh, put all those numbers in, you get this. So that's a half mc squared. I probably should have a bar there. Half mc squared bar equals that. The mass of a nitrogen molecule, well, nitrogen, remember, is N2. So this is 2 times 14 for one atom is 28 times the um, 1 u. So 28 lots of 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 gives us this is the mass of a nitrogen particle. Stick that back into this equation, we get a half c squared is the energy divided by the mass, multiply it by the 2, we end up with this number, which gives us an average velocity for the nitrogen uh, molecules, an average the root of the average squares being 517 metres per second. Okay, this is a rather higher number than it actually the average speed actually is, because we've taken the squares and then taken the average of the squares and then square rooted it. Okay, that's not the same thing as taking the average of the speeds. Okay, chemists will know that there's a distribution called the Boltzmann distribution where particles are going slower than that, some particles are going much, much faster. Those much faster particles tend to skew the average speed as if it was higher than it would be if we could actually measure the average speed of each particle.